one of today's goals is to keep you people on your toes. And so we sang two songs in a row, which is crazy and unheard of, and I'm about to preach. So take that. You know, parent-teacher conferences are um, unique, okay? We got some teachers in here, right? They are, they are unique. I think, I think the idea behind them is good, but what a lot of times ends up happening is it's this one-day snapshot, and we have this conversation with the parent who um, we wish would, maybe we'd just get a little more, um, um, what do we say, connection more regularly. But anyway, they're, they're just kind of unique sometimes. But I've heard these stories. I promise you I have not um, actually ever said this. Well, I've always tried to give very practical advice, but I've heard stories about kids coming in, talking to their teacher, and the teacher says to the parent things like, your kid would do better. They, they need to study harder. Okay, that's helpful in a math class. Um, you need to, they just need to, they just need to work harder, right? And, and there's, of course, some truth to that fact, but you know, can we get a little more specific? I, you know, I also now I'm in administration a little bit, and honestly, I got to tell you, sometimes I feel like Dr. Phil. I really do. Um, couples therapy is kind of what I do Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, I think, sometimes, because it's like drama is always coming my way, and that stuff is like somewhat easy to handle, I guess, but then, then there's the actual, legit, difficult conversations that come in sometimes, with kids who um, struggle with depression or they just, they can't fit in. And I feel so unbelievably inadequate because I, I'm not sure, you know, I mean, I, I'm not gonna tell them to be happier. Like, that's not gonna solve anything, right? And yet it's, it's really difficult to tell them what they can do to, to make it all better. And so, you know, sometimes I think religion is that way too. That we just say, you know, you need to, you need to try harder. That's what you need to do. You need to, you just need to try harder, right? Like you need to be nicer. You need to give more money. You need to teach more Sunday school class, right? Just try harder, right? Do all these things that, that that's kind of what like it feels like in religion sometimes. Come to church more often, all of those things. And so this morning, we're going to spend some time talking about how at the base level, that's not what being a Christian is about. And a bunch of you just went, yeah, yes, yes. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to give any money. Sweet. Later. This is the last church service I've been to. And of course, that's not true, right? But, but at its core level, Christianity is not about trying harder. It's not about a list of things that we do. It's just not. And so this morning, we're going to spend some significant time exploring how salvation cannot be earned. How salvation cannot be earned, it comes only through faith. That's where we're going to spend some time this morning. You see, it's at its core, salvation is not about trying harder. It's not about a checklist of do's and don'ts. No matter how hard you try, no matter how many rules you keep, salvation cannot be earned. It only comes through faith. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you so much for this opportunity to um, share your word. I thank you for how meaningful your word is. I thank you for the fact that you have revealed it to us. And I pray this morning that it might light our path. I also pray, Father, that you would take this time right now to use your spirit to soften our hearts, to prepare us for what you have for us, Father. And as always, our goal, Father, here is to bring you honor and to bring you glory. It's not about anything or anyone else. It's about you. And so I pray, Father, also that whatever I say, whatever is heard, whatever we do brings honor to you this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. My name is Nate. I'm one of the elders here at FBC. It's an honor to get to share with you this morning. And and I just got to say this for a minute. Um, I'm sure you agree with me. Is it not just a great privilege to sit under the teaching of Pastor Joe week after week? Am I right about that? Yes. And he is um, getting some much-needed 
time, which is awesome. Uh, hopefully he's resting, hopefully he's relaxing, hopefully he's having just a great uh, time away. And I think it's good for him, and I, I'm trusting that it'll be good for this church as well, because God tends to, to work in that way. Um, but as I was thinking about that this week, and, and thinking about just what he's done for us, and the amount of commitment that it takes to be a pastor, especially at his age, is just amazing. Here's what I want to do. I want you to either get out your phone, or get out a little piece of paper, one or the other, and what I want you to do is I want you to make yourself a reminder, either in your phone, go to your reminders app, or on a piece of paper, make yourself a reminder. This week, I want our goal as a church to be to bombard Pastor Joseph with words of encouragement, okay? Now, I don't want you to send them right now because it's like six o'clock in the morning where he is, I think. So please do not text him right now. That would be the opposite of what we're trying to accomplish, okay? So don't say anything right now, but text him, Send him a Facebook message. You know what? Go old school. Write him a letter. Imagine that, right? Send him a card, okay? Do whatever you want, but I want you right now to set yourself a reminder because I want like 150 messages or something sent to him this week that just say, hey, Joe, we love you and we thank you for doing what you do for us at FBC. So will you get that down, okay? Get that taken care of Tuesday at three o'clock or whatever. I don't care. Whenever you want to do it, put it in your reminder and let's get that done. We're continuing our series in the book of Galatians. That's where we're at. So if you want to grab your Bibles and flip them there, we're going to go there. Galatians chapter 2 is where we're headed. If you don't have a Bible, you should find one in the seat backs in front of you. So go ahead and flip there. If you uh, don't have a Bible at all, uh, take that one home with you, that one from the seat back, and allow it to be your first ever Bible and use it to learn more about God. So as you're flipping there, I'm just going to kind of remind you where we're at. We're in the series No Other Gospel. No other gospel. We've been working here for a few weeks. And this is a, a Pauline epistle. This is, that means it's a letter written from Paul to the churches, one of the churches, in this case, the churches in Galatia. And Paul's whole message is to remind the people of the truth of the gospel. Okay? So let's see if you've been paying attention for a little while. The series title is No Other Gospel, but there's something that Pastor Joe has been saying over and over and over and over again. So let's see if you've been paying attention. Can anybody remind me of the, the, the phrase that Pastor Joe keeps saying that kind of summarizes this entire book? Yes, good. The gospel equals Jesus plus nothing, period right? Period. And that's where we are, and guess what we're going to do? We're going to hammer that home a little bit more today, right? Pastor Joe's going to be very proud of you guys. So this letter was written in the early life of the Christian church, uh, probably about 25 to 30 years after Christ's death. This is pretty early on, okay? And so guess what's happening as this letter gets written? Everybody's trying to figure stuff out. That's, that's what really is happening. Everybody is just trying to figure out this whole new thing. They're trying to figure out Christianity. And it was no easy task. See, because what happened was Jesus came, right? And he took this system that had been in place for hundreds and hundreds of years. The law. Everything was about the law. And he takes that whole thing and he kind of shakes it up and he kind of mixes it all up and he throws it back at them, right? It's, it's kind of like that sophomore year research paper that you turned into your English teacher, teacher right? And then you got it back and it had more red ink on it than it had black ink on it, right? That's kind of like what Jesus was doing to the apostles and to the Jews. He's saying, okay, yeah, so you thought I meant when you kill somebody, that's bad. See, here's the thing, though. I'm telling you, if you kill somebody, that's bad. But also, if you're angry with your brother, that's just as bad. Or you thought, hey, don't commit adultery. But I'm telling you, anybody that even looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in his heart, right? Right? So he, he has taken this thing, he's reworked it, he shook it up, and, and they're trying to figure out, okay, what is going on? What is happening? How can we uh, uh, now get acquainted to this new system that Jesus has established? And so that's kind of where we are here as we're trying to figure this out. And one of the major components is that they're trying to acclimate the new Gentile believers, so now we've got this whole group of people who don't have the Jewish traditions, who are coming to faith in Christ, and they're trying to figure out how do we reconcile these two totally different backgrounds to this new system of New Testament Christianity. And so last week we saw that Paul even had to correct Peter on an issue 
about the gospel, right? Peter had accepted the reality of salvation through faith apart from the law, including the fact that God had made everything clean. And so that led to Peter hanging out with Gentile Christians, right? Even having meals with them. And then these Judaizers come and they say, hey, you can't be doing that. Those people aren't accepted. And Peter backs away. He's like, yeah, I don't know, you know. And Paul calls him out, right? Paul calls him out. Paul goes, no, 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 no. I don't think so. Galatians 2.14, we read it last week. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, who's Peter, before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Peter's going, uh, to, or Paul's going to Peter, hey, bruh, what are you doing? Right? Like, what are you doing? This doesn't make any sense. He says, the gospel equals Jesus plus nothing. We are not going to add these regulations to what the Gentiles need to do in order to be fully accepted as being in Christ. And so that's where we kind of jump in today, and and we're going to pick up there. So if you want to grab that Bible, Galatians chapter 2, Galatians is after the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And then we got Acts and Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and then Galatians. Chapter 2, and we're in verse 15 and 16 to start. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ, so that we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ, Christ. and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Okay, so we're gonna stop right there. We're gonna camp out right there, and for all my camping friends, we're gonna really camp out. So you might as well put the awning out, you know, put the slide out out, chalk the tires, We're here for a little bit, okay? 15 and 16, there's a lot going on right there. This is a big deal. This is where Paul explains the concept of justification by faith, one of the most fundamental passages in the entire Bible. This passage explains how with Christ's death, the focus of being made right with God has shifted from keeping the law to trusting in what Christ did. Okay, you guys might know Martin Luther. He was a big, big, big guy in the history of the church. Led to the Reformation, okay? And here's what he says. He says, this is the truth of the gospel. It is also the principal article of all Christian doctrine, wherein the knowledge of all godliness consisteth. Most necessary it is, therefore, that we should, con- should know this article well, teach it unto others, and beat it into their heads continually. That's how big of a deal it is. This is what we're talking about today. He also puts it this way. If the article of justification be once lost, then is all true Christian doctrine lost? It's at the core of the Christian faith. So we have to understand it. We have to know it. So we're going to work on the definition here first at the beginning because we're going to talk about this really fancy church term, justification by faith. You know, it's funny. I've been, I've been studying from six different commentaries and commentaries are funny how they work. They, you'll read one, and it'll tell you one thing. You read the next one, and it'll tell you a different thing, right? So they're, they have perspectives. Yet all six of them, when I was reading, when it got to the, this justified term, all of them defined it, and all of them in pretty much the exact same way, which is awesome. So we need to make sure we're clear about what this means because it has drastic impact on things. And I'm sure a lot of you are like, dude, you spend much more time on definitions and I'm going to walk out of here. Just hang with me. It'll be okay. Only take us a second. So the term originally came from the legal term. That's where it was originally. And justification is the opposite of condemnation. It means not guilty. To be declared not guilty. Catch this. It is this unbelievably gracious act of God where we get pardoned, acquitted, found not guilty. And not just that, but we also get viewed as righteous, as accepted. You know, think about, those are two separate things and they're both important. I want you to think about like this. Think about O.J. Simpson, okay? O.J. Simpson, found not guilty, correct? Yet if we polled Americans and we said to them, do you think that O.J. Simpson is guilty or not guilty? Where would it land? I don't know, 50-50, probably heavier on the guilty side, right? Certainly not 
100% of people would say, not guilty. But yet, that's exactly what it means to be justified by, justified by faith. You see, and that's what's really unique about this. OJ case, I, I don't even know. I'm not going to pass judgment. I don't even know what happened there or what the right verdict is. Don't know. But I know one thing. I'm guilty before Christ. I got no chance. And yet, to be justified by faith means not only does God then look at me and go, not guilty, acquitted, pardoned, but he also views me as actually being righteous, which I'm not. That's insane. That's incredible. That's what it means to be justified in Christ. We are completely not what we are. He chooses to see, instead of us and all of our baggage, he chooses to see Christ in his righteousness. That's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. It's crucial concept. It's this fancy term that we talk about in Christianity, justification, that means to be saved, to be viewed as righteous. And as we're going to talk about at the end here today, I think it's every Christian's duty, every Christian's duty, that they can at least give a basic explanation of this concept. So we're going to come back to that, and we're going to hit that again. So why is this such a big deal? You know, why has it got to the point where Peter and Paul even have a disagreement? They have different viewpoints. Why is it such a big deal? Well, imagine this from the Jews' perspective. To be justified by law is what they've been doing forever, right? For hundreds and hundreds of years, their whole life has been about being justified by the law. It means keeping all the law commands and refraining from everything that it forbids, right? It means all of the law, like all the moral law, like the Ten Commandments and everything else that goes along with it, all the ceremonial law, tithing and fasting and I mean, everything, right? Keeping the Passover, the Sabbath day, all these things that they had to do. That's what their life has always been about. And then... All of a sudden, Jesus comes along and says, that's not what it's all about. It's no wonder there was a group of people like the Judaizers who are going, it can't be this easy. It can't be. How does this jive with what we've been doing for so long? It, it's not surprising. It was a huge, huge shift. But let's jump in. Let's look at 15 and 16. We're going to kind of break those down a little bit more as we move forward. No, Paul is very clear. He says in verse 15, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. So first of all, this is a, a continuation of the conversation from last week, okay? So back last week, Paul is telling about how he had to correct Peter. He had to call Peter out, okay? And so this continues to be part of that conversation where he's saying, hey, Peter, you know, what you're doing is bad, wrong, that's a problem because of all of this. So this is a continued conversation about that whole thing with Peter and what was happening with him. The term Gentile sinners, when you read that, you probably go, wow, that's really kind of harsh. Uh, and I guess it, maybe it is in some ways, but it was a fact, right? And that's just how they spoke of it then because the Gentiles didn't have the law. So they had no way of keeping the law. So of course they have to be sinners, right? That was just the way it was. That was the reality for them. They never had the law. Let's keep going to verse 16. It says, Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Paul is saying, Peter, look, you and I, we are both born Jews. Our whole lives have been about keeping the law. That's what we've always known. And yet even us, we can relate to this, because even for us, we've come to understand that salvation comes through faith, not by works. So they have experienced this drastic transformation for themselves so they can speak into it for the Jews and certainly for the Gentiles. So Paul is reminding Peter and the Galatians that nothing should be added to the gospel, not circumcision, not the Ten Commandments, not giving 10% of your paycheck. The way to be reconciled to God is not by performing some list of deeds. It is simply by having faith in what Christ has accomplished. The gospel equals Jesus plus nothing. And I was trying to think through, like, what's a good way to explain it? So I think this is my best bet at it. It's kind of like the opposite of Ikea, okay? So you guys know Ikea, right? Okay, and, and I don't know what their official slogan is, but I'm just telling you right now, their official slogan should be 
some assembly required, okay? Because if you buy something at Ikea, you will spend the next three days of your life putting together something with instructions that are not in the same language and the pictures do not look like anything like human beings or the item you just bought. And you're gonna spend a lot of time with an Allen wrench, okay? Am I right? I've bought some stuff from Ikea, okay. So I think their thing should be some assembly required. The gospel is no assembly required. That's what it is. It is exactly what it is, and after you know what it is, you do nothing to put it together. It's already done. It's taken care of. The gospel equals Jesus plus nothing. There is no assembly required. You see, the problem with the law is the reason we need to go to this system, the problem with the law is the law can't save us. It can't save us. All it does is condemn by proving that we can't keep it. Right? And that, and that was really kind of its purpose. It kind of showed people the fact that they couldn't keep up with what God had for them, the standard that he had. The law cannot promise life. It can only threaten death. And this isn't a new concept. Look at what David said in Psalm 143. He says, hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my pleas for mercy. In your faithfulness, answer me. In your righteousness, enter not into judgment with your servant. For no one living is righteous before you. And who does he appeal to? In your faithfulness, Lord. In your righteousness. Who's doing the salvation? Not us. Never us. It's only through God, which is through Christ. What's probably most amazing is that anyone could think that they could ever be found righteous through the law, right? It's the biggest lie that's ever been out there, or one of the biggest lies that's ever been out there. A strict adherence to the law is beyond us. And if we really search our hearts and minds, we know this is already true. If we really are honest with ourselves, we know that our motives are far, far from innocent. We might do good things, but why do we do them? There's a good quote from Timothy George. He says, no human deeds, however well motivated and sincerely performed, can ever achieve the kind of standing before God that results in the verdict of justification. And Paul knows this. He knows this firsthand. This has been his whole life. He's been all about keeping the law. It says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 6, as to righteousness under the law, Paul was blameless. It's what he did. And then he was walking along the road and his entire life changed. Paul goes from being in this perfect spot as far as being a Jew to realizing that what he was doing would not lead him to restoration with God but would simply drive him further and further away. And so he lays it out three times in verse 16. He lays it out generally, he lays it out personally, and he lays it out universally that faith in Christ is what justifies us, not by works. He says in 16a, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. He says we know that a person, this is in general, but it also includes Peter because it says we. He says in part B, second part of, of uh, verse 16. This is where he gets real personal about it though. So we too, Peter, you and I, remember? We have put our faith in Jesus Christ that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. We've been through this. We've experienced this for ourselves. We know that it's not about what we do. It's about trusting in Christ. And then he gets very universal with it in 16, the last part. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Catch this part. Whatever our religious upbringing, whatever our educational background, whatever our social status, whatever our racial origin, the way of salvation is the same. None be can be justified by works of the law. All flesh must be justified through faith in Christ. This passage is powerful and meaningful. This is a core piece of the Christian faith. 
Let's keep going. We're going to slap, step down to 17 now. Verse 17 through 21. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live in God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. So Paul begins here in verse 17. He starts to lay out a little bit of a, like an argument against what he thinks he's going to hear, which is, okay, this is too simple. What you're trying to tell me is they don't have to do all these things. They just have to come to faith in Christ. But isn't that just going to turn around and have a bunch of people then just start sinning a bunch? Because it's all about just faith in Christ. So you're going to make it so that Christ is a minister of sin. And he says, certainly not. Certainly not. Paul is very clear. At the very core, we are sinners. Our justification through faith does not change that fact. It is simply that God has chosen to view us as not guilty. The sin has always been there. Being justified through faith does not create, nor does it encourage the sin. And then he goes on to verse 18. He kind of goes the other direction. He says, for if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. He says, listen, if we come across that and somebody who claims to have faith in Christ and to have trusted in them, they continue to build back up the life of sin that they had before Christ, they're missing something. They're not getting the whole picture. Timothy Keller says, if someone who professes faith in Christ keeps on with the same sinful lifestyle, rebuilding the sinfulness that Christ died to destroy the penalty for, making no effort to, to change, then it proves that this person never really grasped the gospel but was looking for an excuse to live in obedient, disobedience to God. And so, no, it, it, it doesn't make Christ a minister of sin. No, it doesn't mean that we continue our life of sin. No, but still, justification is found in faith in Christ. Romans chapter six, Romans is a great book, right? Romans is a meaty, meaty text. It's... Uh, complicated and difficult at times, but it's very good. Paul wrote it, of course, and in chapter 6, he kind of lays this out. I would encourage you, to, uh, chapter 6, 1 through 14 is all very good in terms of kind of relating back to what we just read. I'm just going to read the first part. He says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Should we keep, should we keep sinning because that makes God's grace even stronger? He says, by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. That's what it means to have, be justified by faith. We still are new in our life. Check that out a little bit more. It's very good in chapter six of Romans. Let's keep going. Galatians, we're in chapter two, now 19 through 20. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, Paul has realized that the law proved that he was never good enough. And so he died to the law. That means he quit living for the law. That was what he had always done. That's what his life had all been about. And he, he dies to that. When Paul realized that it was about having faith in Christ, he died to his former way of life. And he did that so he could actually start living for God. Catch this part. In his former way of life, Paul was obeying God, but only so that he could earn something in return from his obedience. And that is selfishness. That is sin. It was really all for Paul. All to build a picture of how holy Paul is. Does this sound like somebody you know? 
Because this guy, he struggles with this. For many of us, it's a real struggle. Our obedience to Christ is really more about building a persona that leads us to looking good. And that's not at all what it's about. That's not at all what we're called to. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's what our life needs to be about. It's not about some follow all these rules because, man, it makes me look good. That's totally backwards. That doesn't get us anything. That's not how obedience works. Verse, verse 20 at the end there is so good too. I'm gonna read this nice and slow. Make sure you catch this. In the life I now live in the flesh, Paul says, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, this faith thing is a personal thing. Just dwell on that for a minute. The son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, it's funny because we sit here, there's lots of people in this room. We're all hearing the exact same words, right? But yet at the exact same time, every single one of us, each and every one of us on our own and in our own way can say, the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's so personal. And then he kind of finalizes this, this passage with a little bit of a summary. He kind of nails it right at the end. I just love this. Verse 21, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. It's the strong warning. He's saying you have to understand that it can't work both ways. Because if you continue to try and merit your way to God, if you continue to try and earn your salvation, to try and say, I've done this, and I've done this, and I've done this, and therefore God sees me as righteous. If you continue to do that, the entire time you do it, you make Jesus' death on the cross useless. All you're doing is weakening what he did. It can't be both ways. It's not about you meriting your favor before God. It's about you trusting in the work of what Christ has already done. It was more than enough from the very beginning. We are refusing to let God be gracious when we do that. I want to spend a couple minutes here at the end talking about some applications as we kind of close things out. The first application, and we've been talking about it before, it's not new We'll continue to hit it in this series. Fight legalism. Legalism means what? A push to make sure that we follow all the laws. That's at the core of what we do. The Galatians were tempted to gain favor with God by getting circumcised. That's obviously not a, a major temptation for Christians today, but many, of other, many other things are, like going to church. We talked about this before. Reading the Bible, taking communion, attending every single event that the church has, giving to charity, right? These things will never get us into heaven. Not even becoming a martyr for the cause of Christ will ever be enough to merit you reconciliation with God on its own. So we have to be very careful. Those things are all good things, of course. They come into play. We're gonna hit that as we get to the end of Galatians. That, that fruit is important in the Christian life. It is. But it has no place in our salvation. The only way is through Christ. And of course, that doesn't mean we go all the way, like I said earlier, to the other side. The other side of legalism is license, right? Where we just go do whatever we want because, hey, I've been saved through grace. Woo! Do whatever I want. We don't want to go there. But I've got to ask you, I've got to get you to stop and think for a minute right now. In your life right now, what drives your obedience to God? Be honest with yourself. What drives your obedience to God? Is it an attempt to merit your way to God? You know, I think one of the things that this comes in, I talk about this sometimes, it's so big though. One of the ways that this really gets played out is the comparison game that we like to play. Right? Like, I may not be perfect, but that guy, right? I'm better than that guy. 
Well, let's draw a picture of what that looks like. Here's that guy. If you're better than that guy, maybe you're right here. What's the standard? The ceiling? Right? Or something so far out of reach that I don't care what list of things you do or how much better you are than anybody else, you will never get there? So what is driving your obedience to God? What is driving your obedience to God? Comparison is a killer. So are you attempting to merit your way to God? Or are you obedient to God out of a genuine desire to please him? In your mind, is there an awareness of the fact that no matter how hard you try, you just don't measure up? But knowing that, you've trusted in Christ and you're living to honor and glorify God because of it. This is crucial right here, big point. Your obedience should be an outpouring of thanksgiving for the fact that God has rescued you in spite of who you are. That's what obedience is all about. It's not some way to merit favor. It's not some way to work our way towards salvation. It is an outpouring of honor and praise to our Father because he provided a way when I had no shot, no chance. The second application piece is, I think, also big. I mentioned it earlier on. Can you explain the basic concept of justification through faith, not by works, to another person? This is a big deal to me. You see, because if you ask a non-Christian, if you go to a non-Christian and you say, hey, tell me, what's Christianity all about? Chances are they're going to tell you following a bunch of rules. Because from the outside world, that's what it looks like. That what we're about is making sure that we do this and then do this and then do this and then do this. And if that's the picture we're giving them, will they ever make their way to God? No. Never. So all of us, you and I, everybody here, not just Pastor Joe, not just Pastor Spencer, not just the full-time people who work in a church or, or missionaries, all of us as Christians have a responsibility to be able to explain to people that faith in Christ is what brings you back into reconciliation with God, and that alone. We have to be able to tell them that. We have to be able to use words that will help them to understand it's not about doing this and this and this. It's not about meriting anything before God. It's about believing that Christ died for them. And so you say things like, I know being religious might seem like it's a bunch of rules, but the goofy thing is that's actually not at the heart of Christianity at all. Because the Bible actually says we don't need to earn our way to heaven. We can't perform a bunch of good deeds in order to convince God to love us. Salvation cannot be earned. It comes only through faith. And you start to paint the picture of what justification by faith really looks like. And so as we wrap up this morning, you know, I don't know what your background looks like. I don't know. Maybe you came in here today and you're really wondering about this whole thing. Like, what is he talking about? Or maybe you're wondering, like, I don't really think God even exists. So, what? And so this morning, I want to challenge you that if you've never re realized in your life what it means to actually put faith in Christ, that you might just let this sink in right now. That the fact of the matter is there is a creator God. He created each and every one of us. He created this entire world that we live in. And that he desires so badly to be in close relationship with all of us. But the problem is, and if you think about it, you know it's true. Whether you believe in God or not, you know it's true. You're not perfect. So you can't even be with him. He's too holy for that. And so no matter how hard you try, no matter what you do, all morning we've been talking about it, you cannot get to the point where you can convince God that you're good enough for him. It's just a reality. But the good news is he loved you so desperately that he sent his only son 
to die on the cross. He came, he lived a perfect life, sinless, did everything perfectly, and still died. Why? To take your place, to take my place. So that we, by trusting in him, can be viewed as righteous. That is a fact. And so by believing in Christ, by trusting in him, by saying, you know what, God, I believe that you created me. I believe that you sent your son because I'm not good enough and that he paid the price for me by just having faith. We are reconciled to God now, in a moment. All that is required to be justified is to acknowledge our sin and helplessness to repent of our years of self-assertion and self-righteousness and to put our whole trust and confidence in Christ to save us. And so we're gonna go into a little bit extended time of, of worship through music this morning now. And I want a couple things to happen. One, if you've never trusted in Christ, I really want that to just sink into your heart. And if you have questions about that, if you're like, what, what does this really mean for me? How does this actually look? Come and see me. I'm gonna just stand by the back doors. I'd love to talk to you. And if you have trusted in Christ, then my prayer this morning as we go into this time of worship is that you might just once again be refreshed anew about what it means to be in obedience to to Christ. And that this time of worship is designed because when we realize what has been done for us, not because of anything we've done, but because God chose it, he sent his son for us, that we should naturally just, just sing out in praise and honor. And so I want you just to kind of let go of everything else. I want you to wipe away the world, and I want you to focus on what Christ has done for you and sing his name in honor and glory. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you so much for today. I thank you for this opportunity to share your word, and I thank you for the truth of your word. Father, I pray, Father, this morning that as we prepare to worship and song this morning, that your spirit might be working powerfully. Lord, as I just said, that the distractions of everything else in the world, what we got going on this afternoon and and what this week brings for us and all those other pieces, that they might just fade away, that they melt away. And that because we think tonight, or to this morning about what you've done for us, because we think this morning about the fact that our obedience is 100% based on the fact that you have been amazingly gracious to us, that you might just let us go to worship you in spirit and truth. Father, I pray that all of this is for you, all of this is for you, and nothing else. Meet us here right now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.